Today we, we have uh, a great professor who has studied race and ethnicity, uh, Ian Haney Lopez, and he's been the author of several books about identity, both black and Hispanic. Uh, Ian has written the book that is on sale right now, uh, Dog Whistle Politics. And it's so relevant for what's happening in our country today as we explore implicit bias and the new way that racism is shaping itself. Ian is, uh, was born or, or grew up in uh, Hawaii. And uh, he's a, an avid biker. And he's done biking in the Rockies here as well. He uh, is a, been a visiting professor at uh, Yale, New York University, and Harvard. Uh, he has degrees from, in history, a master's in history from Washington University, a master's in public policy from Princeton, and a law degree from Harvard. Uh, he's a chair professor currently at UC Berkeley. And I just think we are just very privileged to have a thinker and an, and an activist type person to be here to share with us new insights that will make you go, hmm. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to welcome Ian Henny Lopez. Hello all. Let me transition here for a second. So I actually want to start with my own thanks. I'd really like to thank Harold. I'd like to thank um, uh, the Colorado Foundation, um, History Colorado, and I really do need to thank Carla, who's just been instrumental in doing this. I'd like to thank all of you, because I know sort of how busy you are and what it means to come out on a Tuesday evening. I'd also like to start by asking us to pause for a moment and think about Baltimore. Baltimore, as it symbolizes the, the, the pervasiveness of police killing African American men and women and children. Baltimore, as it symbolizes white flight and cities that have been abandoned once they became integrated, abandoned not just in the sense that whites fled, but in the sense that we as a society withdrew resources from those cities. Baltimore, as an example of what happens with rage and frustration and how easily it turns to violence even against oneself, Baltimore as a source of language, thug, inner city, crime, welfare, or suburbs, middle class, hardworking American, decent Americans. These words don't mention race, and yet, they're heavily racialized. You understand the racial implications of these terms. And so when we talk about dog whistle politics, I'm talking about a sort of politics which is suffused with terms like the poor, the middle class, suburbs, hardworking Americans, welfare, right? Suffused by it. And what I want to argue is that this sort of politics has been common in the United States, this sort of coded racial appeals has been common in the United States ever since the Civil Rights Movement, that it is directly connected to what we're seeing in Baltimore today, and also, and this is very important, and also, that it's connected to the catastrophe in the country as a whole in terms of surging inequality. And here I want to pause, and I really want to emphasize this point. Most conversations about race are conversations that focus on what's happening in poor minority communities. And that's important. And it's a national disaster, and we need to focus on it. But what we don't recognize is that the catastrophe of race has also befallen whites. This is the way I want to try and get you to see that. 
So I, so I ripped this off. I mean, I, sorry, I liberated this <laughs> from Robert Reich. This is sort of Robert Reich, Inequality for All. And this is, this is one of his early slides. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, look at what's happening to our society. Look at the way in which we have wealth, levels of wealth inequality we haven't seen in a century. And when you look at it, uh, Reich tells the story. And he says, in the run-up to the Great Depression, the rich took more and more of the share of the national wealth. Um, uh, then we have the Great Depression. That wipes out a lot of wealth at the top. But importantly, we as a society realize that government must help everybody and not just the very rich, and so we enact a series of policies. We begin to enact progressive taxation, taxing the rich more than we tax the poor. We begin to create routes of upward mobility for the poor, a social safety net. We regulate the workplace to make work to protect workers from exploitation. We regulate the marketplace so that the marketplace won't be dominated by monopolies and can't be rigged. Right? Um, all of these sorts of policies, we put them in place, and what's the result? The largest expansion of the middle class, the country, and indeed the world has ever seen, right up, and then you see this declining income inequality, a growing middle class, right up until 1980. And then the trend reverses. Reich knows the policies. If you ask about a chart like this and say, why did this reversal? And the question is policy. We know the policies, right? And you can talk to someone like Robert Reich, Paul Krugman, Joe Stiglitz. The policies are clear. What happens in, in 1980? We start cutting taxes for the very rich. We start slashing social programs that helped people with ladders of upward, upward mobility. We, quote, deregulate the economy, by which we actually mean we hand control over the economy back over to corporations and let them write their own regulations. Right? Those are the policies. Here's the harder question. Why do so many people vote for the politicians who are doing this? That's the mystery, right? Because if you want to think about what's happening in terms of elections, think of the 2014 midterms. We have two houses of Congress dominated by politicians who are promising that they will pursue exactly the sort of policies that are wrecking the middle class. Right? And so this isn't just Baltimore. This isn't just police violence. This is what's happening to most whites in this country today in terms of their jobs, in terms of equity in their homes, in terms of their pensions, uh, in terms of their health care. Right? This is what's at stake. And so I want to give you a sense of how race is putting all of that in jeopardy, not just in Baltimore, but for whites too. Here's how I want to begin the story. Some of you recognize this? That's Barry Goldwater. Yes, Barry Goldwater. All right, 1964. Barry Goldwater, he's a scion of a wealthy retail family in Arizona. He's elected senator uh, um, from Arizona. Um, he is a diehard opponent of the New Deal, right? He, he's, you know, he, well, let's be clear, he's rich. So he's, so, so I've got him up here, this is what he looks like as a senator, I've also got him up here dressed as a cowboy. But that was not just sartorial affectation, that was also political ideology. He espoused the ideal of the sort of the cowboy, the rugged individual. And who's the rugged individual? The rugged individual works hard, takes care of himself, takes care of his family, contributes to his community, but doesn't ask anything from the state and doesn't owe anybody anything. And so that's all great, life on the range, right? But in an industrialized society, the cowboy actually turns out to be the capitalist who doesn't owe anybody anything, who gets to keep whatever he makes and shouldn't have to pay taxes. And the cowboy turns out to be the ideal, from, this, from, from Goldwater's point of view, for the worker, who should be on his own. If you make it, great. If you don't, have the cowboy's dignity to lean up against that swallow cactus and die quietly. <laughs> right? That's the vision, right? the rugged individualist. If you make it, you keep it. If you don't, please, keep it down when you're dying. Right? That's the vision. Now this vision, this had actually been prominent in the United States in the late 19th century. But it dried up and blew away in the winds of the Dust Bowl. People said, there is no dignity 
in poverty, in hunger, in suffering. Dignity comes from community, comes from sharing, comes from hard work, comes from a sense that we're all in this together, that when we stumble, somebody picks us up, and once we're on our feet, we thrive, and then we help others back to their feet. That was the vision that we embraced in the New Deal and that we articulated as a vision which government helped everybody, not just the very rich. Goldwater wants to go back, and he knows nobody else does. So he comes up with a strategy. This is the only text I'm going to show you, but it's really, really important. This is the strategy. In 1963, the Republican National Committee met here in Denver. And this is what the political leaders came up with. The racial crisis, that was the civil rights movement. And the, and the Republican leaders were saying to themselves, listen, white anxiety is increasing in response to demands for equality and integration. Maybe we can take advantage of it. Right? But I want to be clear about this. They weren't saying that because they were racist. They were saying that because they thought it would be a good strategy. If there was a white man's party in 1963, it wasn't the Republicans. In 1960, 27% of African Americans voted for Republicans. They weren't the white man's party in 1963. That was the Southern Democrats. The Southern Democrats had organized themselves expressly around white supremacy. It was the Southern Democrats who had disenfranchised African Americans throughout the South in terms of <laughs> fraud, uh, um, uh, felony disenfranchisement laws, violence, even lynchings. That was the white man's party. But here you get the Republicans saying, hey, we can do this. We can use rising racial anxiety among whites to start winning white votes. But, and here's the other key point, we need to do so through code. We need to be the white man's party in fact, though not in name. Why? Because the, ve the very success of the civil rights movement was making white supremacy as an avowed express ideal immoral. Illegitimate. You could not stand up in 1963 outside of the South, and, and increasingly even in the South, and say, I represent the white man. You needed some other language. You needed code. And so what did Goldwater say? Well, he came up with two key phrases that he used. States' rights, freedom of association. Now, you know, maybe from the point of, listen, so I teach constitutional law where I have to teach federalism, that's states' rights, federalism. I, it's hard to keep my students awake through that, right? And, and they're law students. How are you going to campaign on states' rights? Who cares? Southerners, Southerners cared because they knew states' rights meant the right of Southern states to resist integration. And freedom of association, I mean, that's even more abstract. The, the, you know, it's this libertarian, free, like, I, I get to pick my friends, what? But people understood freedom of association meant the right of white business owners to exclude African Americans, the right of white homeowners to refuse to rent or sell their properties to blacks. And so these are the codes, these are the dog whistles that Barry Goldwater campaigned on in 1964. And how did he do? Terrible, terrible, he did terrible, he was crushed. He was absolutely crushed. Because in 1964, Barry Goldwater is running against Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson is the embodiment of this New Deal sensibility that is so popular. Right? And let me give you a sense of who Lyndon Johnson was in 1964. This is Lyndon Johnson, one of his, one of his campaign commercials. Poverty is not a trait of character. It is created anew in each generation, but not by heredity, by circumstances. Today, millions of American families are caught in circumstances beyond their control. Their children will be compelled to live lives of poverty unless the cycle is broken. President Johnson's war on poverty has this one goal, to provide everyone a chance to grow and make his own way. A chance at education, a chance at training, a chance at a fruitful life. For the first time in the history of America, this can be done. Vote 
for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. And people did. Two out of three whites voted for Lyndon Johnson in 1964 at a time when he was promising what no Democrat would dare to promise today, that we can end poverty, that it is within our grasp, that we have a moral responsibility to do so. And here's what's key, that white people are poor, if you think about the imagery, and that poverty is not a trait of character, but is a reflection of circumstance. With that message, two out of three whites voted for Lyndon Johnson. Right? And so uh, back to this, it was a landslide victory for the candidate who promised to ex extend the New Deal into the great society. This was a moment when the political class as a whole said, well, that's it then. We are fundamentally a liberal country. We are fundamentally a country committed to a vision of activist government that helps lift everybody into the middle class, that provides routes of upward mobility for the poor. There is no future in a Republican Party that continues to war against the New Deal. That was the consensus. And yet, there was a distant alarm bell coming up out of the South in those red states. Because something strange was going on there. They should not have voted for Barry Goldwater. The Deep South should not have voted for Barry Goldwater. Why not? Well, one, Goldwater is a Republican. And Southern whites, and those are the only people, by and large, who are voting in the South, are Southern whites. They hated. Well, that's too weak a word. <laughs> Loathed Republicans. They blamed Republicans for the so-called War of Aggression, sometimes known as the Civil War. <laughs> they blamed Republicans even more for school integration, because it was a former Republican governor, Earl Warren, who wrote the opinion in Brown versus Board of Education that declared segregation inherently unequal. And it was a Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower, who was the first to send federal troops into the South to enforce integration. Southern whites detested Republicans. And they loved the New Deal. They loved the New Deal. Right? The South, even more than the North, had been laid low by the Great Depression. And the New Deal helped pick up the South in a way it provided assistance even greater than anything experienced in the North. Indeed, if you think about something like the Tennessee Valley Authority, that brought electricity to millions in the South who'd never had electricity. It brought them electricity. They loved the New Deal. And they voted for a Republican who promised to dismantle the New Deal. I mean, Goldwater was running around campaigning, promising that he would sell off the TVA. And they voted for him. And this is the warning, that the most committed Democrats, the strongest supporters of the New Deal, could be convinced to vote for a Republican who promised to dismantle the New Deal if they were appealed to in racial terms. That's the threat. How would it play out? <laughs> so I understand that History Colorado now has an exhibit called 1968. This is 1968 and Tricky Dick Nixon. Okay? Nixon initially is running as, Nixon initially is a moderate as a Republican, a supporter of New Deal programs. He thinks because Goldwater lost so resoundingly that maybe race isn't such a good way to go. Because Johnson won so resoundingly that maybe he needs a campaign by promising, and he does, promising wealth transfers to the poor. And yet there's a third party candidate, George Wallace, who's running to, to pick up the sort of anxious white vote, the white supremacist vote, and he begins to flank Nixon on his right. And Nixon thinks late in the campaign, Maybe I need to tack right on race. And so late in his campaign, Nixon starts to say, I promised to slow school integration in the South. He barely wins. Did race help him across the finish line in 1968? He doesn't know. He's not sure. But by 1970, pundits on both the Democratic and Republican side have crunched the numbers and both agree. The answer is clear, race 
can be used to break the New Deal coalition. Race can divide the white working class from African Americans and Northeastern elites. And starting in 1970, Richard Nixon begins to campaign aggressively as a dog whistle candidate. He starts to promise about slowing school integration in the South. He starts to talk about states' rights and excessive federal intervention. He starts to talk about law and order. Right? He starts to talk about welfare. And indeed, um, uh, you know, all of this time, these are dog whistles. He's, he's not saying black out loud. He's saying law and order. But, and here's one of the benefits of Richard Nixon taping himself and, and uh, taping the bug in the White House. We know that watching one of his own campaign commercials talking about law and order, he said, yep, that's it. It's all about law and order and those damn Negro Puerto Rican groups out there. Right? He knew what he was doing. And one of his advisors went on record as saying Richard Nixon made the decision he'd go after the bigots. And that's what he did. That's how he campaigned from 70 to 72. How did he do in 72? 67% of whites voted for Lyndon Johnson in 64. Eight years later, 70% of whites voted for Richard Nixon. Now, a lot of political commentators look at this and say, I guess we're not a liberal country. I guess we're shifting. I guess we're going back to being a traditionally conservative country. But I don't think this is a tidal shift from liberal to conservative. I think this is a tidal shift around race. The racial fears that proved so powerful in the South with the civil rights movement swept the nation. I think what we're seeing here is the southernization of US politics, where whites across the country can be bamboozled into voting their racial fears. I think that's what this indicates. Now, as extreme as this is, this is only the first half of dog whistle politics. And I want to suggest to you, it's not the most important half. This is not the half that wrecks the middle class. That half comes up with this person. This is Ronald Reagan. Right? This is Ronald Reagan looking happy, pleased, and the happy warrior, the great communicator. This is his first official campaign stop. So he has just received the nomination to be the 1980 Republican candidate for president. This is his first campaign stop as the official candidate. It is in Neshoba County, Mississippi. Philadelphia County, sorry, no, the Neshoba County Fair at Philadelphia, Mississippi, which is infamous because 16 years earlier, three civil rights workers had been kidnapped there. They'd been lynched. Their bodies had been stuffed in an earthen dam and not found for months. There wasn't a voter alive in Neshoba County in 1980 when Reagan went there who hadn't been alive when these three civil rights heroes were killed. And Ronald Reagan went down there and he said, I believe in states' rights. Four years later, he'd go back. This was no accident. Four years later, he'd go back and he'd say, the South will rise again, right? A neo-Confederate slogan, okay? This is Ronald Reagan who understands the power of race to mobilize white anxiety. But Reagan's no Nixon. He's no moderate Republican. Reagan gets his start in politics in 1964 as a spokesperson for Barry Goldwater. He is himself a diehard opponent of the New Deal. He wants to roll back government that helps the middle class. How is he going to do this? He's going to do this through a story about race. So on the campaign trail, Reagan will look out at his audiences, and they are overwhelmingly white audiences. And he will say to those audiences, I understand your frustration when you're standing in line waiting to buy hamburger and some young fellow is ahead of you buying a T-bone steak with food stamps. Now, the first time he told that story, I think he was worried that it was a little too subtle. <laughs> so he didn't say some young fellow. He said some young buck. He's a southern term for a strong black man, one resistant to white authority, one who lusts after white women. 
Now, that wasn't a dog whistle anymore. He was roundly criticized for it, right? That was the shriek of an oncoming train. He was roundly criticized, so he dropped it. Does, he stops talking about young bucks. He just talks about some young fellow buying a T-bone steak with food stamps, right? Pause here. You all know that, that, that Kansas and Missouri just passed laws limiting what people can spend food stamps on, yes. right? That both of those states are doing the same dog whistle from 1980, the same one. You know, Kansas just passed a law that says you can't use food stamps on cruise ships. <laughs> but here's the irony. You can use them at a gun store. <laughs> it's like, yeah, Kansas, right? Okay, so, but the same dog whistle. Now think about the imagery. Think about the racial imagery. The imagery says, African Americans, they could work. They're strong, they're young, they could work. They don't want to. They would prefer to rip off the system. They're not just lazy, they're scammers, they're schemers. They want to rip off the system. And because they're ripping off the system, they're living high off the hog. That's one. Two, the you who's hardworking, who's playing by the rules, who's struggling. Implicitly, that's white folks. Reagan is saying, white folks, you guys are decent, you're hardworking, you play by the rules, and because you play by the rules and you're decent and hardworking, you're struggling to make ends meet. Things are tough for you, and I'm sympathetic. But there's a third character here, and it's the most important character, and maybe the one that's hardest to see initially. Government. Because Reagan is saying, Government is the real enemy. It's government that's reaching its hands into the pockets of those decent, law-abiding, struggling whites and taking their hard-earned dollars and wasting it on those scheming no-good minorities. And, and Reagan says, I got a solution for you. Starve government. Cut it off. Well, how do you do that? One, cut taxes. Two, all of that social spending, all that welfare spending, all that spending on schools, all those protections for unions, all of that um, uh, infrastructure, it's all for minorities. Cut it off. Slash government spending on the sort of programs that help the middle class. And another thing, Reagan says, we can't trust government, but who can we trust? Corporations. The job creators. Get government out of the way of business. Right? And so what do we get? We get a series of policies that hand over regulation of the marketplace and of the workplace to corporations. We get massive cuts in the social spending that actually helped lift people into the middle class. And we get massive tax cuts. For those hardworking, long-suffering, white working class folks, no, no. During the 1980s, the Reagan tax cuts transferred a trillion a trillion dollars of wealth to the top 1%. And we have never repealed those tax cuts. And each decade since, a further trillion dollars of wealth has gone to that top 1%. And in fact, all we've done is we've deepened those tax cuts. So when you see that Robert Reich graph and income inequality plateaus and in the 1970s and then in the 1980, it reverses and starts to rise again, you know the policies but now you know the story too. Starve government because government is just helping minorities. It's the story about race is what's animating so many white voters to support politicians who are pursuing policies that are wrecking this country democratically and economically. I mean, wrecking, unless you're the Koch brothers. If you're the Koch brothers, <laughs> things are getting better. But short of that, right? Okay, I mean, let me. Pause here. Is it only race? No, of course not. Nothing's only race. Nothing's only one thing. We should be clear. The sort of culture war politics that starts with race, it quickly becomes evident that it can be extended to gender, that it can be extended to talk about traditional families, um, that it can be extended to talk about um, people who seek abortion on demand or people who want access to contraception, that it can be extended to gay marriage, that you can talk now about uh, Christians who are being persecuted um, or government coming to take people's guns or their bullets away, right? So this, this, this emphasis on coded racial appeals becomes part of a larger culture war politics in which lots of relatively powerless groups are demonized as a threat in American life. 
in a way that obscures the increasing power and wealth being handed to corporations and the very rich. That's one. Two, the message is resent government. And listen, by 1980, there's lots of reasons to resent government, and not all of them are connected to culture war politics. Some of them have names like the Vietnam War or Watergate. Right? In addition, once the Republicans understand that their game plan is to increase resentment of government, they start doing everything they can to gum up government. Think about Newt Gingrich and his contract on America. For America? On America. Which one was it? <laughs> right? But essentially, their idea is paralyze government, increase resentment, people vote locally so that they can continue to get reelected, even as resentment towards Congress that's here to the federal government skyrockets, which plays into the message that government is our enemy. Cut taxes, starve it, look instead to the private marketplace, to the job creators. Right? That's, that's what they're doing. So it's, it's not all race. OK, I got that. But yet, central to this is race. How central? 1964 was the last time a Democratic candidate for president won a majority of the white vote. No Democratic candidate for president has won a majority of the white vote since 1964. And today, the Republican Party draws 94% of its support from whites. 98% of its elected officials are white. I mean, this is a part, we are a country that is now 63% white. The Republican Party is whiter than most golf clubs. <laughs> Why? Because for 50 years they have been pursuing a strategy based largely on racial fear. Or not largely in, in the sense of predominantly, but based heavily on generating racial fear. Okay, let's go on. The Willie Horton ad, worth watching. Ronald Reagan's vice president, the first George Bush, He's in trouble politically. I, uh, uh, I'll share with you why really quickly. Um, because Reagan deregulated uh, the financial market, and in particular the savings and loan industry, and there was massive fraud, including by George Bush's son, um, that led to a collapse of the savings and loan industry that stalled the economy. Um, and in 1988, when Bush is running, a lot of people are out of work. I don't know if you know that deregulation, financial fraud, economic collapse, I don't know if you recognize that pattern. <laughs> anyway, Bush is in trouble. He's behind in the polls. And then he comes up with this ad. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing a man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. Dog whistling? Didn't mention race. Never said the word race. And so the Democrats think to themselves, how do we respond? How do we respond? And now listen. Remember, the Democrats realized at the same time that the Republicans did in 1970, race could be used as a wedge issue. But they made a fateful decision. They thought that what they were fighting was a sort of a, an organic grassroots backlash. And they thought, OK, the civil rights movement, maybe we push too far. We need to slow down. We need to stop talking about race. We need to distance ourselves from African Americans. And if we just don't talk about it, this will burn out. What they didn't realize, it wasn't just, I mean, it wasn't just grassroots resentment. It was a strategy on the part of conservatives to constantly reinvent and stoke that resentment. Right? And so this wasn't going to go away. OK, so they continue their policy here, their policy of not addressing race. And so the first month that this ad is playing, they say nothing about it. And in that month, 12% of the electorate shifts their support from Dukakis to Bush. And Bush is now solidly ahead, and Dukakis is in trouble. And it's two weeks before the election. 
and Jesse Jackson just can't take it anymore. And finally, he's the first Democrat to come out and say, this is race baiting. This is racial demagoguery. This is trading on racial fears. And the media, I wonder if you're going to, I'll just use this mic. And the media, excuse me, I'm going to take this off for a second. It, it's only allowing me to look left, which <laughs> that's kind of fine with me, but. <laughs> I'm, I'm also trying to, I'm trying to be broadly inclusive, trying to be broadly inclusive, so okay. <laughs> Jesse Jackson speaks out. The media picks up the frame. This is mudslinging. This is race baiting. This is racial demagoguery. They say, this is outrageous. Shut up, they say. Jesse Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. They blame Jackson. Right, because dog whistling is part of a larger conservative rhetoric on race, and here's how it works. Use coded racial appeals to constantly hammer race into the conversation. The minute you're criticized, turn around and say, hey, I didn't say black, and I certainly didn't use an epithet, so I'm racially innocent, right? Or say, me, racist? You really hurt my feelings now, right? Which is what George Bush said when Jesse Jackson criticized him, George Bush says, I don't have a racist bone in my body. It's like, I don't care about your bones. This isn't, this isn't about racism. This is strategy, right? But so punch it into the conversation through coded appeals, then parry any criticism by saying, hey, I didn't say the word black. And then go back on the racial offensive and say, but I'll tell you what, I know who did say a race word. And the first person to mention race is the racist. So Jesse Jackson, since you said race, you're the racist, right? This punch, parry, and kick, right? And, and we still see this all the time. The first person to say race is the racist, and usually, that's me. I'm always talking about race, and I'm just running around. In, in, in fact, I was, on, uh, I was talking with Larry King, and then he had sort of commentator coming on afterwards, um, and her, her big retort to my analysis was, that guy's a Berkeley racist. <laughs> Punch, parry, and kick. If I say race, if anybody says race, we're the racists. And so the Democrats relearn their basic lesson. Stop talking about it. Stop talking about it. And yet that lesson wasn't working. They were losing. They were continuing to lose. They would have to do something else. Bill Clinton figured out what else they could do. There are a new generation of Democrats, Bill Clinton and Al Gore, and they don't think the way the old Democratic Party did. They call for an end to welfare as we know it, so welfare can be a second chance, not a way of life. They've sent a strong signal to criminals by supporting the death penalty, and they've rejected the old tax and spend politics. Clinton's balanced 12 budgets, and they've proposed a new plan investing in people, detailing $140 billion in spending cuts they make right now. Clinton Gore, for people, for a change. If you can't beat them, join them. That's what Clinton figured out. Clinton decided that he would not oppose dog whistle politics. He would master it. Right? He's going to oppose welfare as a way of life. Well, whose way of life is it, supposedly? He's going to crack down on crime. OK, but who are the criminals? He's going to cut government spending. Why? Because government's the problem. He adopted and amplified Reagan's themes. Right? And, and so two things I want to say here. One, since the 1990s, Republicans and Democrats have been competing with each other to show who's tougher on blacks, who's tougher on minorities, who has the interests of the middle class code whites at heart. That's one. Two, this is Baltimore. This is where Baltimore is coming from. Right? Now, I understand that there were riots in the 1960s that, re that, that, that represented frustration and segregation and poverty and immiseration and the lack of jobs. But ever since then, what have we done? We've largely made those circumstances worse because we want to, the, 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 the politicians want to show that they don't care about minorities. And they're, they're not wasting money on minorities. And two, almost all of our political leaders have been using a language that continually links blacks to crime. 
And so in the intervening years, we went from the 1970s when we had roughly 200,000 people in prison to a present circumstance in which we have well over 2 million in prison. We created a system of racialized mass incarceration. Because politicians, it's not just words. You can't just stay on the stump. You've got to prove that you're tough on minorities, that you're hard on crime. Ratchet up the police control system. Throw away the idea of rehabilitation. This is about punishment. And Bill Clinton did much more, much more, to build up the carceral system we have today than even Ronald Reagan, because he wanted to prove he was a new Democrat. This is, this is Baltimore. This is why we're seeing Baltimore in 2015. Because rather than deal with the problems of, of segregation, of inequality, we've doubled down on them, Republicans and Democrats alike. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead now. I'm gonna skip all the way to 2012, but see if you recognize this person. He's back! <laughs> Bill Clinton! This is a Mitt Romney ad. This is not just any Mitt Romney ad. This is the Mitt Romney ad that the Romney campaign is gonna spend half its advertising budget on. Right? This is the ad that they think is going to win the election for them. Watch this ad. In 1996, President Clinton and a bipartisan Congress helped end welfare as we know it by requiring work for welfare. But on July 12th, President Obama quietly announced a plan to gut welfare reform by dropping work requirements. Under Obama's plan, you wouldn't have to work and wouldn't have to train for a job. They just send you your welfare check. And welfare to work goes back to being plain of welfare. Mitt Romney will restore the work requirement because it works. I'm Mitt Romney, and I approve this message. Yeah. Every time I hear that voice, you need the heebie jeebies. <laughs> first, first. The factual predicate here was false. Obama didn't do this, right? It, it, it has no basis in reality. And in fact, the politifacts, you know, that sort of ranks politicians and, you know, and the, 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 the veracity of their ads, pants on fire. <laughs> it's just flat false, right? And this produced for me my second favorite moment in the campaign because a Romney uh, spokesperson responded to the politifacts ranking and said, we will not let our campaign be dictated by the facts. <laughs> no, of course you won't. You'd lose if you had to pay attention to facts. Let's go with frames. And what's the frame? Here's the frame. There are good Democrats out there, good Democrats who are tough on minorities, like Bill Clinton. And there are bad Democrats out there who just want to give stuff away to minorities. And this is the welfare frame that Nixon used, that, that Reagan used, and now Romney is trying to use it. Half his, his advertising budget, half his advertising budget, trying to paint Barack Obama as a welfare type candidate, right? And you, you probably remember Newt Gingrich running around saying Barack Obama is the best food stamp president in US history, right? So, and, then, and then when somebody says, hey, that's racist, he says, no, no, this is just fact. It's like, yeah, the other fact is we just went through the second biggest economic calamity in the history of the country and a lot of people are freaking starving. And that's why food stamp use is going up. But that fact was neglected. And what was emphasized was this is a food stamp president, this is a welfare president. And notice, when Nixon told this story, when Reagan told this story, their message was government and the Democratic Party is for minorities. When Romney tells the story, the Democratic Party and government not just for minorities, it's by minorities. The whole government has been taken over by minorities. Cut it off. Right? Okay. Um, this is my favorite moment. So we gotta see this. All right, we gotta see this. And, and here's the question for you. Is this dog whistle politics? And I want to say, well, it can't be, because we're about to, to uh, slam half the country. Right? It can't be. Maybe. There are 27% of the people who vote for the president of Colorado. All right, there are 27% who are with him, who are the kind of government, who believe that they're victims, who believe the government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they're entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to anything. <laughs> And that's an entitlement, and the government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. And, and so my job is not to worry about those people. I'll never convince them that they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. What I have to do is convince the 5 to 10% in the Senate 
They are victims. They think of themselves as victims. They think of themselves as dependent. They have an entitlement mentality. They think they're entitled to food, to shelter, to health care, to you know what. This is dog whistle politics. And yet it's not just about minorities. Romney is taking the frame that has been used to demonize minorities as undeserving, as unworthy, as scheming, as lazy, and he is transferring it to half the country. Half the country. And I, I want to pause for a second just to be clear about which half. That 47% number, this is a number that, re that reflects how many people pay federal income tax. And Romney is saying, listen, 47% don't pay federal income tax, while neglecting to say, they pay social security tax, um, uh, um, uh, they pay sales tax, they pay property tax. On average, that, 14, that 47 percent, many of them pay over 14 percent of their net income in taxes. Or put differently, many of them pay more than Mitt Romney, the millionaire. <laughs> but he's not saying that. He's saying half the country now think that they're victims. They are dependent on government. They refuse to take responsibility for themselves. And here's the kicker, and we don't need to care about them. Here is a man who is running for president of the United States who says, half the country, die quietly. You're on your own. I don't have to care about you. Meanwhile, substantively, what is he promising to do? He is promising to cut taxes for the very rich. He is promising to slash government spending. His, camp, his, 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 his vice presidential candidate, Paul Ryan, is threatening to actually like, completely gut the federal government. He is promising to hand over regulatory control of the marketplace to corporations. He is promising to do the very things that have produced the Great Recession, while saying to the public, I don't have to care about half the country. How can this man possibly win? Okay, spoiler alert, I don't know if you guys were paying attention, but he didn't. He didn't, he didn't win. Except among whites. This is what the electoral map would look like if only whites had voted. Mitt Romney won three out of five white votes. He won in every region of the country. He won among white men, he won among white women, he won among the elderly. He also won among the young. Race mattered more than region, than age, than gender, mattered more than all of those in driving the white vote. They voted for a man who said of the country, I don't have to care about half the people, and I promise to pursue policies that give wealth and power to the wealthy and powerful. This is where we are now. This is dog whistle politics. Right? This is the reality we confront. How do we respond? I wasn't just going to leave you there. I mean, as bleak as this is, how do we respond? I'm going to conclude here. I think there are things we can do. First thing we have to do, not buy into the complacency that comes with changing demographics in the country. Right? Demography will not save us. There are a lot of people who are saying, a lot of people, including people, you know, pundits, New York Times type people, a lot of people are saying, hey, we don't really need to worry about dog whistling. We don't need to worry about the fact that the Republican Party is virtually all white because the country's changing. Um, uh, increasingly, whites will become a minority. They are really, really wrong about that for two reasons. First, and I don't know if this will come as a surprise to you, but as whites learn that they are becoming a minority, they don't become racially progressive. <laughs> they get more anxious. They get more anxious. And as they get more anxious, they also shift to the right politically. Right? So as many whites come to understand uh, that their proportion of the, of the population is declining, they become more and not less susceptible to dog whistle politics. That's point number one. Point number two. The Census Bureau tells us that the United States will be minority white in 2043. 63% today, minority white in 2043. Unless you include Hispanics who consider themselves white. 
in which case in 2043 the white population in the United States will be 72%, right? Here's, here's a core point, and I really want to stress this. I've been talking about white persons, white persons, white persons. Let me be clear about what's going on here. I don't mean people of European descent. That's not, that's not white person in a relevant sense. I mean people committed to the idea of whiteness. People committed to the idea of whiteness. And what is the core idea of whiteness? The core idea of whiteness is that some of us are decent, some of us are hardworking, some of us play by the rules, some of us deserve to run this country. Whereas others are dark and dangerous and dirty and disease-ridden and they are a drain on our society. That's the idea of whiteness, that some of us belong and others of us are threats. The idea of whiteness does not depend upon a narrow definition of white. You can expand the definition of who's white. And as long as people still believe in whiteness, it remains a dangerous, destructive force. And so expand it. Expand it to include those Latinos who think of themselves as white. And that is somewhere between 40 and 50% already. Expand it to include East Asian populations. Expand it to include South Asian populations. Expand it to include some African Americans. Right? The actual, your skin color, your descent, not as important as whether you believe some of us are decent and hardworking and deserve to run the government and others of us are dark and dirty and dangerous. Because if you believe in whiteness, that idea of, of deserving beset by the undeserving and the dangerous, you're susceptible to dog whistle politics. And what we're fighting here is this idea of whiteness, of some who belong and others who are poor and dangerous. That's what we're fighting. And we have to fight it because this is a strategy. And they will continue to develop and evolve that strategy in a way that includes more and more people if that's what allows them to win. Again, this is not about racism. It's not as if the Koch brothers uh, or uh, Frank Lutz or, or Fox News is sitting back there and saying, we're doing this because we really hate black and brown people. That's just collateral damage. What they love is power. And race is a tool towards that power. And if they, if they have to expand the boundaries of who counts as white, well, they're well on their way. OK, so we need to respond affirmatively. How do we respond affirmatively? First thing we have to do is we have to understand responding affirmatively to dog whistle politics in the last two weeks of a campaign Bad idea. Right? That's the lesson to learn from Jesse Jackson. You wait until the last two weeks of the campaign, forget it, you can't do it. We have been fighting a concerted uh, uh, effort to craft a powerful narrative about who we are that has been going on for 50 years. We need to respond on the same terms. We need to have a sense that we are responding not just for 2016, not even for 2020, that we need to engage in a long-term project of reconstructing our sense of who we are. OK, first step in that process, we need to reclaim government. We need to reclaim government. I can't tell you how many sort of progressive conferences I've gone to um, in which I've listened to amazing, creative, high energy, social change oriented people who all talk in the language of volunteerism. And very few or none of them ever say, we need government. We need government to help us. But let me tell you in an advanced industrialized society like ours. We cannot have a fair and inclusive society if we don't have government on the side of all of us. If government remains the tool of the 1%, then all of our energy will be spent tinkering at the margins and we will remain a fundamentally closed, unequal, declining society. We must reclaim government, not as it exists currently, it has largely been captured, we should be clear. But we must have one of our core goals, the sense that government must, should help all of us. That's one of the core ideas that we need to reinvigorate. Second, the minute we start talking about government helping us, we're gonna be hammered by dog whistle themes. People are gonna respond by saying, oh sure, you want government, because government's all about giving things away to minorities, about forcing integration, it's about abortion on demand, it's about making me bake cakes for, for gay couples, right? 
We need to reject that sort of divisive politics, and that means we need to reject racism. We really need to understand how race is working, how race is dividing us. We really need to be able to say to people, do the biggest threats in your life come from people who are poor, people who are powerless, people who are marginalized? Or don't they come from the corporations, the Koch brothers, the 1%, and the politicians in their pocket? And we need to tie that to race. We need, we, race needs to be a central part of that conversation. Last point, take pride. We, on the left, have tended to respond in terms of policy, because we know what policies would work. But most people are not thinking in terms of policy. Most people are thinking in terms of their sense of self what they feel proud about, who they think they are, who they think they're connected with. And we need to respond in that same level. We need a social movement that reconstitutes identity uh, here in the United States and that has something affirmative, something that people want to join. What would that be? A notion that we as Americans, and I, and I really want to say American, right, and, 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 and draw on patriotism, draw on pride, say this is a beautiful country, it is full of beautiful people, that we are hardworking people, that we are generous people, that we take care of each other, that we believe each other, that we love each other, and that we are tolerant. Tolerant. Now, people on the left don't really like tolerant, because tolerant is not as good as esteem. Right, where you like really fully see yourself in somebody else and you esteem who they are. I love esteem as a goal. Maybe we'll get there. We don't need to get there to defeat this politics. We just need to get to tolerance. The tolerance in the sense of people saying, hey, I may disagree with you. I may not have that much in common with you, but I see that you and I are in the same boat, that we're in this together, and I refuse to be fearful of you. I refuse to be hostile toward you. Right? And let me just say this, over 93% of Americans identify tolerance as a core American value. This is something that is within easy reach. We can say to people, who are we? We are hardworking, we are generous, we are loving, we are tolerant. But we need to understand we're building a social movement when we do so. Okay, last comment, last comment. Somebody up here stands up and says, let's build a social movement, and you all think, great, but I think I'm just going to go home and have a beer, right? Because, I mean, how do you do that, right? Here's some concrete advice. You don't build a, t a social movement from scratch. You build it in terms of what's already out there. And what are out there? What are out there are a number of organizations. Some of them are working on the environment, some on education, some on immigration detention, some on mass incarceration. Uh, some on welfare, some on infrastructure, some on solar, some on financial regulation, some on getting money out of politics. All of these organizations, join them and then take them over. <laughs> because they, in a way that very few of them recognize, they don't exist in silos. They're all united by a culture of war politics that has said governments are enemy. None of these groups can win individually without combating the sense that government isn't our enemy, that we need government on our side. None of these groups, and here's what a lot of them don't recognize, none of these groups can win without taking race on frontally. We have a lot of groups that are dedicated to race, and then we have a lot of groups that say race is for those people, I'm not going to work on it. All of those people out there saying race is for those people, I'm not going to work on it, y'all are going to lose because you're being defeated through racial narratives. So, so, so the vision that we need to have is we are trying to create a social movement based on the idea that we're all in this together, that government can help us, and that we refuse to be divided. And the way we do that is by working through these organizations that are already on the ground, active and energetic, trying to make this a better society, trying to take power back from the corporations. And within those organizations, we begin to stress the linkages across all of these domains, and, 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 and its relationship to racism and other cultural war politics. That's how we can do it. That's how all of you can get started on this project. All right, thank you all.